So before we begin, uh, would someone open us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We come before you in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this first day of the week, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for this session that we are going to have on Corinthians, Father God, even as we have gathered here to study your word, Father God, to meditate on your word, Father God, help us, God, give us understanding, Lord God, that we may understand your word, Father God, and that that we may be used in your in your kingdom father god lord help us father god to grasp every word that comes forth from your servant's mouth oh lord father god holy spirit we pray father god to please anoint our dear pastor as she will be teaching us the word use her <clears throat> for the expansion of your kingdom father god help us let our minds and hearts be here father god and not to be distracted from anything father god we thank you lord for doing this for us in jesus mighty name we pray amen mm -hmm. thank you okay so um we'll do a quick recap like we always do of what we did last week and then uh, move into chapter eight uh, we started a bit of chapter eight last week yeah, we will uh, just read from the beginning again today. Uh, would anyone like to do a recap for us? Uh, last week's contents. So last week, um, let me just look at covered exactly. Last week we covered uh, seven, seven to eight, three. Yeah. I'll just give it off something. Um, yeah. So I think we already started chapter seven a little before and we just continued uh, chapter uh, seven uh, where we saw about that singleness is a gift from God uh, to Paul and uh, I liked how you said uh, we should act according to the gift that has been given to us. Sometimes we look at others and we think we should also do the same, but it's actually not that. We should act according to what gift has been given to us. We should act. And uh, we saw the two uh, instances where divorce is, uh, is a, a load, actually. So if someone decognates other adultery, uh, divorce is uh, accepted. And if there is an abandonment, then divorce is actually accepted and um, yeah we also saw the difference between what is the difference between being sanctified uh, versus uh, being saved um, and uh, uh, okay and I think the main thing was to live as how we were called what's the gift uh, it's given to us and Paul we saw Paul differentiating the spiritual and physical state of a person in some verses and uh, I also liked how he stated we should not be concerned about the spiritual thing sorry physical things most of the time but we should be more concerned about uh, how our spiritual state is in what our relationship we are with Christ um and we saw about uh, being bought at a price, how much it was used two times over in this chapter. And uh, 
how we should be fully loyal to Christ. Uh, we should never be a slave to someone else. Um, and then we also saw uh, uh, how to be content wherever we are. Uh, we should not keep constantly <laughs> changing. And then we started, uh, I believe this chapter ends this section of uh, sexual immorality, his teaching on sexual immorality. I think this chapter ends it, and then we are going to move into the new one. I, yeah. yeah. And then we moved into chapter eight, where it talks about idol worship. Uh, uh, we saw how knowledge pops up, but uh, love edifies. Uh, and uh, even in Revelation, the book of Revelation, we see knowledge will be in space, but uh, there will be a lack of uh, love. So everyone's end goal is to love God and everyone around us more. Um, yeah. And we saw that uh, rather us knowing things, God actually knows uh, a lot about us. Rather us knowing about him, rather knowing about things, God actually uh, knows us. We saw that in verse 3, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. And we just, we had this stressing on how much God knows us. And I think that's where we ended. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, uh... Yeah, so we finished the section on uh, on sexual immorality and generally what are the boundaries for uh, sex and how we can uh, protect that. And now Paul moves into the section on uh, eating foods offered to idols. So. Um, we saw in the beginning, uh, verse 1, it says, now concerning things offered to idols. So it seems like uh, Paul already had a list of things that he wanted to address in this letter. So it was based on uh, the Corinthian response to him from the first letter he had sent or uh, or from reports that had come in. Uh, but it, it seems like these were the questions that the church was asking that he was responding to it uh, based on uh, based on the questions that he had received and so he goes into this next section on idol worship so uh, from chapters 8 to 10 he'll uh, he'll talk about idol worship in between he'll talk about his own life as an example um, and then again he'll go back to idol worship uh, not idol worship sorry eating foods offered to idols in uh, chapter 10. so uh, yes these first three verses uh, he is basically talking about one group of people who uh, feel that they know a lot and so in their knowledge uh, they uh, they think it's okay to eat food offered to idols and there's no problem with it uh, because idols are not gods after all. Um, and so he is mainly addressing this group of people uh, to tell them that knowledge isn't everything. So uh, knowledge without love uh, will actually cause harm to the body of Christ. Uh, but love is more important in fact, he um, elevates love above, above knowledge. And so uh, we look at how he does that in the following verses. So we'll continue from verse 4. Uh, if someone can read verses 4 to 6. Verse 4, so then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, in verse 4, um, 
he says, so when giving us this um, basic um, understanding that love is what we are after, we are not uh, seeking only knowledge, uh, he then goes on to say, therefore, this is how we will look at eating food of adults from this perspective. Uh, and then he says, we know. So if we are only going by knowledge, uh, we know that there is no power in an idol, uh, that an idol is just a physical object uh, that uh, cannot speak, it cannot do anything. It's just uh, something uh, that is an object that people have given reverence to. Uh, and we know that there is no other God but the God we worship. No other God but one. Uh, verse 5, for even if there are so-called gods, so there are, uh, there are gods that people worship, correct? Uh, even if we don't believe, we say there is one God, there are other people who have gods that they worship. And uh, these gods, uh, whether in heaven uh, and on earth, there are many gods and lords that are worshipped by other people. So uh, they call them God and they call them Lord. But for us, there is one God. Uh, and uh, so we see here uh, a little um, theology also included in this verse 6. There is one God and then in that one God is the Father and the Son. Okay, the father of whom are all things, uh, and we for him. So the father who is the source of all that exists and is the purpose for which we exist. And one Lord Jesus. So when he's saying Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that Jesus is not God, right? He's saying one God, the father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the word Lord here uh, refers to someone who is supreme in authority, who is a master or owner or possessor of things. And so uh, he's using a different word, but that word uh, is a word for God. So one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. So um, that uh, role of Jesus in creation uh, being the one through whom creation was made and through whom creation continues to be sustained is seen um, in various verses in the New Testament. So uh, we can look at uh, some of these. If someone can read John 1, 3 to 4. John. One, three to four. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was being made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Thank you. And uh, Colossians one sixteen to seventeen. Someone read that. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. Thank you. And then uh, I'll just read from Hebrews 1, 2, and 3. It says, uh, through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Uh, so Paul is uh, saying what has been said uh, in the New Testament, first in John and then uh, Hebrews is a later book, uh, Colossians as well. So all of these books, talk about Jesus as being uh, being the uh, means through which creation uh, was brought into existence and the one who sustains us, who gives us life. Uh, so uh, Paul brings these things as a contrast to an idol, 
right? So an idea is not living and cannot enable anyone to live or cannot bring things into existence. Uh, but we worship uh, the God who is creator, God who is alive, um, a God who uh, in whom is life and who sustains life. Uh, and so for those who had that kind of knowledge, who knew uh, the power of God the Father and Jesus Christ, uh, for them, it made sense to eat food offered to idols because what are idols in comparison to this God, right? They are nothing. So there is no need for us to worry about what is given to them. There's no need for us to even think about it. We can just eat it as something that God has given us. Uh, but let's go on uh, in this chapter and see what else Paul says. Verses 7 and 8, if someone can read that. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Thank you. So, uh, so he's contrasting these people who are taking pride in their knowledge with another group of people who do not have such knowledge. Uh, and these uh, likely were new believers or uh, believers who had come out of a uh, from. Uh, religions or practices where there was idol worship, right? Because there were so many Gentile believers uh, who had come into the church. So they came from a background of idol worship and they had given up their idols to follow Jesus. Um, but many of their friends and family members would still be, would still have been continuing to worship idols. So if they were having family events, if they were meeting with business associates or uh, there were usually people who, if they did the same kind of work, they would form guilds, right? And so these guilds would have meetings and um, all those things would take place uh, within the temple uh, hall. And in this hall was where food was offered. Uh, and this, was, this would also have food that had been offered uh, to the ideas. So they would find themselves in these situations because they had come from that background and they were continuing to associate with their family and friends and um, people in their guild. Uh, and so they had to face this question in a very real way uh, compared to, say, a Jewish uh, Christian now, someone who'd come from a Jewish background. Uh, they didn't have that kind of social pressure uh, in the way that the Gentile believers had it. Uh, so these Gentile believers, uh, Paul is saying that they still thought of ideas as gods. Not all of them, but some of them still thought of ideas as gods because they had been so recently worshippers of ideas and they just come out of this. They still have not developed in their understanding of God. They have not uh, moved so far from that experience that Idols are nothing to them now. And so for these people, if they uh, if they are viewing ideas as God, then uh, if you are eating it, then it it affects them. We, we look at how it affects them. Uh, so he's saying, if uh, we know that food will not draw us closer to God, or will not keep us away from God. But for uh, for people who consider an idol as God, they would view that food that was offered to ideas, if you partake in it, that it was a way of honoring 
the idol or honoring that God. It was viewed that that God was present with you in that meal. And so when uh, when you're eating uh, food offered to idols, that's what they would understand when they saw you, that you are honoring that God and that uh, you are inviting that God into that meal that you are having. Um, but for those who uh, were mature, were more mature, or were from a Jewish background, uh, this would not be something that they uh, that they even thought about or worried about. Especially the Jews, uh, one was some of them would even carry their own food when they went into a temple meal, uh, so that they would not partake of uh, the meat that was offered. Of course, that would also cause offense to the person who, was worship, uh, who had invited them. Uh, but that was one way they dealt with it. On the other hand, they didn't have to deal with it as much as the Gentile believers. Um, and also here we see a, a distinction between the rich and the poor. So the rich had a lot of access to meat. Uh, it was part of their daily diet. On the other hand, the poor didn't have such access uh, and where they would most see meat is in the temple premises because the temple during festivals would give it out free to uh, to people who came to the temple. So that is where they would have actually been having most of their meat before they were uh, believers. So again, meat for them was associated with idols. <clears throat> So with that background of the distinction between the Jewish believers, the Gentile believers, the rich, the poor, all of that, uh, it was their backgrounds that was informing how they were viewing the food they were eating and how they were treating food offered to ideals. Uh, we go on from that verses 9 to 13. Verses 9 to 13, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling, a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the con conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weakness, uh, their weak conscience, your, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if God makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Thank you. So uh, here, yeah, verse 13 is, <clears throat> therefore, if food makes my brother stumble. So um, <clears throat> that kind of provides a, a summary of what he's saying. Now, food is something that is of such low value in comparison to our eternal life in Christ, right? So if food is a hindrance to someone's eternity, to their uh, being with Christ, then I would rather give up meat completely so that uh, so that my brother in Christ, so a fellow believer, would be able to uh, walk faithfully with God. Uh, so we looked earlier at two scenarios in which people would come across food offered to ideas. One was in the temple premises, uh, in or near temples where the uh, meat was sacrificed and then was given to the people in the temple who had come for the sacrifice or come for that uh, festival or people who were around there. Uh, the other place we would see this meat was in the marketplace. So uh, here he's addressing that first, uh, first scenario where you would see it um, in the temple. So um, verse 9, he says, let's somehow Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. So these people, like we saw earlier with the issues in sexual immorality, there was a lot of pride, right? Because they were boasting in their spiritual freedom uh, that they had. In the same way here, this was an issue of pride where they were boasting about their liberty, that 
we uh, can we can uh, exercise our freedom in this way uh, by eating food of a tragedy. So we don't have to be afraid of it. So uh, there was a pride associated with it. Um, but he says in verse 10, if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating uh, in the temple, so this is that first scenario, will not their conscience, which is weak, uh, be encouraged to also participate in what you are doing. So they see you eating in the temple. They see you honoring this God and participating in uh, what is a part of the worship, right? The, they had worshipped the idol. They had given that food. And from that worship, the food has uh, been taken and is being shared. So you are participating in that worship. So uh, for those who consider these ideas as gods uh, and seeing you honoring that God and participating in that worship, would they also not think it's OK? It's OK to participate in the worship. It's OK to honor that God uh, by taking part in the meal. Um, verse 11. Um, because of your knowledge, the weak believer is going to die. Uh, <clears throat> so they are committing a sin because they they think it's okay to show reverence to another god or to uh, participate in worship to another god, and they do it with that thinking in their mind. You might not be doing it with that thinking, but that's how they are approaching it. And so you are leading them astray. You're leading them into sin. Um, and when you do that, you are actually sinning against Christ himself. Okay, so Christ died for their salvation, but you are leading them back to death. And uh, you are then, um, you are sinning against not only them, but also against Christ. Uh, so then we go back to verse 13 of, I'd rather give up meat altogether than let that be a cause for somebody else falling into sin. So with that, we'll go into chapter 9, where it looks like uh, Paul is actually going into a different topic altogether. But chapter 9 actually is using his own life as an example for what he's sharing in chapter 8. So when he's talking in chapter 8 about uh, making this sacrifice for the sake of other believers, he then talks about his own life and how it reflects that kind of sacrifice. And then he'll go back to how does it, then how can we take this and apply it to our lives in chapter 10. Um, so uh, some things that we'll see Paul talk about here in chapter 9 is uh, specifically about what uh, his role as an apostle. So there were some people who questioned his apostleship um, uh, based on the fact that he was not one of the original 12. Uh, there were other people who didn't uh, give him the honor due to church leaders like we had discussed because he was a manual laborer. So because he was not following uh, what was considered as the um, accepted form of work for a philosopher or a thinker uh, or the wise people of that day. Uh, so some of the church members didn't give him that, uh, didn't accept him fully as a church leader, or as a teacher. And so Paul is talking to those people in this chapter. Uh, before we go into the chapter, we look at what does it mean to be an apostle? I'm sure all of us are aware of uh, what it means to be an apostle. So the Greek word means, uh, literally it means to be someone who is sent. Uh, so someone who is sent to represent another person, uh, to act on their behalf, uh, and to carry out a mission for the person who has sent them. So they've sent them with a purpose, to carry out a specific uh, task. And so uh, the apostles were people who were sent by God to carry out the mission of Christ. Uh, we see three categories of apostles in the New Testament. Okay, so uh, Revelation 21 14 talks about the 12 apostles who are uh, 
the 12 who followed Christ. So we had the 11 and then the 12th one was picked to replace Judas. Um, and the criteria for those 12 apostles is in Acts 1, 21 to 22. Uh, maybe we can just look at that quickly. Someone can read Acts 1, 21 to 22. it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Thank you. So uh, we see that that was the criteria for the first 12 apostles, somebody who had been with Christ in his ministry, uh, right from his baptism by John to his final uh, ascension to the Father. Okay, um, So that those 12 apostles cannot be added to or removed from. They were already a fixed group of people uh, that were called uh, the apostles. Uh, then there is another group of people called the founding apostles. If we can look at Ephesians 2.20 and Ephesians 3, 1 to 5. Ephesians 2.20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Thank you. And uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, please. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly, in reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the ministry of Christ, which was not made known to people in, in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So uh, this was the second group of apostles, apart from the first 12, were the founding apostles. And these apostles uh, were uh, the ones who brought teaching to the church, who uh, brought the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ and what, uh, what all was available to the church and to people who received Christ. Uh, they brought that revelation to the church. And so uh, this was another set of apostles. And Paul was one of the founding apostles, like we just read in Ephesians 3. Uh, and then the third category is uh, the apostles who uh, are so by the ministry gift that they have received. Uh, so that is, uh, in our present day, uh, people who have the gift of apostleship. Who have given, who've been given the gift to minister to the church today, to build the church and equip the church and uh, prepare the church for Christ's return. Um, we can look at that, Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. So uh, this is a third group of apostles who are present in our uh, church at present, right? In the present day church. Um, so apart from uh, the apostles as in this category being people who are sent, we are all sent as ministers of God. 
so we all carry out this function of apostleship, uh, which is to be people who are sent by God to carry out his work and his mission. Uh, so when we look in this chapter, Paul talks about his apostleship. He doesn't refer to uh, his his encounter with God in the road to Damascus, or he doesn't refer to the revelations he's received or the journeys he's made to take the gospel to many places. Uh, he doesn't talk about his preaching. He doesn't talk about the churches he's raised up or the epistles he's written. Um, he will talk about these things later, but in this part, he talks more from the perspective of someone who is a servant of Christ uh, and who has uh, given their life over, they have sacrificed uh, everything in order to serve Christ. Uh, so we look at his uh, sacrifice, his stewardship, his serving, his self-discipline, uh, things that he did as an apostle uh, because he was an apostle to fulfill the mission that God had entrusted to him. Uh, and so taking from his life we can take a lot of truth into how do we then minister? How do we uh, adopt this, uh, this attitude or this uh, posture of being a servant, of sacrificing, of stewarding all that God has given us uh, to serve the people God has uh, entrusted to us? So we look at verses 1, um, so 1 to 15. It's a a little long. Let's see if we can break that up. Okay, maybe we'll just read the whole passage, 1 to 15, and then after the break, we'll come back and talk about it. So if someone can read verses 1 to 15. First Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 15. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is trading out the grain. Is, is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in with what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. Thank you. So uh, we have a few minutes, so we need to look at a few verses. Um, so 
he first starts off with, uh, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Um, so how is this connected to what he was saying in chapter 8? Uh, he's saying, am I not an apostle? Is, isn't it that I have the authority and the power that is enjoyed by apostles? Uh, am I not free? That is, uh, is my service uh, not free of any um, any evil? Right, everything I'm doing uh, is pure and is being offered with that purity. Um, have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? So. I have um, a great revelation of who Je Jesus is, right? So I'm as good as the apostles uh, who encountered Christ. I've also had an encounter with Christ. Um, are you not my work in the Lord? So uh, the fact that you as a church are in existence is because of the work that I did. Uh, so I brought the gospel and I uh, ministered to you all and have continued to build you all up as a church. And so you are uh, this, the church that exists uh, is the fruit of the work that I did. Um, verse two, if I'm not an apostle to others, uh, at least for you I am, right? So even if other people don't see me as an apostle, uh, to you, I am, uh, because the fruit of the work that is your, the fact that you exist as a church and all that is being seen in you as a church, so uh, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, all of that that is being seen in you is evidence of the work that I did and is evidence that I am an apostle of Christ. So uh, what is seen, the fruit that is seen is evidence of my role or my position in Christ, what God has entrusted to me. Um, so he's uh, here he's saying uh, he's kind of putting himself in a position of authority. The truth is that he does have a lot of authority. He does have a lot of power. Uh, he has great uh, revelation of Christ and there is great fruit for what he has done in the church. Uh, but this is not what he's going to depend on and he's not going to demand things of the church based on these things, based on the fact that he has the authority of an apostle or that position of an apostle, uh, not based on the fact that he's received revelation of Jesus and so he can demand that the church uh, be obedient to him or listen to what he has to say uh, and not based on the fact that they uh, are enjoying the benefit of knowing Christ and being part of a church because of his work. So all of these things are a uh, very good basis for him to make uh, make demands from them, right? Uh, we see that so often, uh, unfortunately, among uh, even church leaders where there is a lot of expectation of things that they should receive from people who are uh, in the church or people who are in there who are following their ministries. Um, they are put in a, on a pedestal. They have a place of power and authority. And so they use that for their own benefit. Um, on the other hand, we see Paul uh, saying, I don't choose to do that. And this is why I don't choose to do it. He'll go on in the rest of the chapter. Uh, so, okay, we have another minute, so we'll just take a break and we'll go continue from verse 3 when we come back. Come back uh, in 10 minutes. Thank you. 